Welcome to the Sales Compensation Show, where we share the latest sales performance research, insights, and solutions through in-depth discussions with industry experts. So put that spreadsheet away, grab a beverage, and enjoy the conversation. I'm your host, Justin Lane. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome to today's show, Maria Ochko Kanat. Maria is an experienced sales performance and compensation management professional with over 15 years of helping organizations automate and optimize complex sales compensation programs, plans, and processes. Currently, she is a senior director, global sales planning and performance at Workiva. Maria, welcome to the show. Thanks, Justin. Good to be here. Now, we've had the opportunity to work together, but for the folks that don't know you or your current company, Workiva, can you tell us a little bit about what you do there, what you oversee, and how the company helps their their customers? Sure thing. So Workiva is a global SaaS company. We provide cloud-based, connected, and reporting compliance, a platform for that reporting compliance. And then we do have the enablement of connected data and automation of reporting across risk, compliance, and finance. Uh, so we're really heavy in the audit departments of a lot of enterprise companies as well as any companies that are either public or going public. We have a big capital markets and SEC uh, component to our business. Uh, We are in about 22 different countries at this point with about 600 uh, direct sellers uh, and and support teams that we support from a sales perspective. And then my background at Workiva is that, yes, like you mentioned, Senior Director of Planning and Performance. And what that encompasses is anything from territory and account planning to quota capacity uh, coverage modeling, and then into the plan design management, as well as incentive compensation management, forecasting, and then performance insights. So all the analytics and productivity insights uh, for the org, and then all the SPM tools that uh, help support those activities. Okay. So I think there's three topics that I wanted to cover today. And I think just based upon kind of your journey from sales compensation all the way through to this global uh, sales planning and performance role today. I think you have some great insights for people that are listening. But the first topic I wanted to talk about, because you recently went through it within the last couple of years, implementation. And implementation specifically of a sales performance management tool and some of the different components. Broad brush strokes lessons learned for people that they can have a better implementation or a more effective implementation from somebody who's been through it? Yeah. So given my time on the on the consulting side, you know, I saw lots of customers go through new implementations, sometimes coming off old systems, sometimes not. And that was really great. And I was able to bring all that knowledge to Workiva when we decided to implement a new SPM tool. However, before I even got here, Workiva had gone through two other journeys of trying to implement an SPM tool. And so internally, there were some lessons learned and things that we really wanted to avoid uh, this time around. Uh, The number one thing was really around understanding what it means when you go through SPM requirements. And the only way that you're going to get that full understanding is if you have the people who have done it, who have lived it, who have breathed breathed it. And what I mean by that is when you have this in-house team that manages those areas, it's a lot easier to get through requirements and have an understanding of the data that you'll need to drive a successful implementation, the resources, the expectations for ongoing upkeep, all of those things. When you are just starting out and maybe you don't have people dedicated to SPM activities, maybe you don't have dedicated incentive sales analysts, or maybe you don't have, if you're using any other SPM tools, you don't have dedicated teams centered around that or roles centered around that. It's a little bit harder because you're learning as you go with requirements. And so the data can be challenging. You may not understand all of the dependencies to get the results that you want or the utilization or experience that that you want out of the tool. Likewise, if if there's roles leading the projects that don't interact with sales daily or don't deal with the results of the SPM outputs with sales, then that's going to be another miss that they have with requirements or data is what does sales expect to see and and how do they want to translate that or or work with that information. So all of those were lessons learned at Workiva that we tried to avoid this uh, third time around. And we did it successfully just paying attention to what are the true requirements? What does it take to execute the results we want? And then the data behind all of it, right? Lots of data scrubbing and, and improvement in processes with our CRM data and accounting data. 
I think one of the ways that I've described what you just described is this idea of you don't know what you don't know from the client side of the implementation. Third time around, plus your experience and some of your team members that you brought on, I think you probably avoided that. You had a good understanding of what the tool could and couldn't do and what really good looks like from an implementation standpoint. The second thing I like to think about is the idea of reporting first and then work your way back to data. Did you take a similar strategy? Were you thinking about the, the visualizations out of the application or did you try to deconstruct the plan first and work middle out like, like a lot of other companies do? Yeah, we took the approach, like I mentioned, actually for seeing what is sales expecting to see. So from the sales perspective, if they're expecting to see various metrics or visuals on productivity performance, what is it going to take to get those results out of the tool? And so we started there, then worked into selfishly, right, from the ops or finance perspective of metrics, and then the plan design itself, um, which we also had changing. So we needed to cover all of those bases. And that's what got us to what is that data that we need. Um, it's more than the calculation, as you and I both know. And the calculation is one piece, but then it's that output, like you said, the reporting. And that kind of looks and feels different for every audience. So we did round tables of requirements for every audience. And I think sometimes that's missed quite a bit when we worked with other customers. Um, when I have in the past with other companies, they're so focused on just one piece of that SPM execution, whether it's instead of call up, right, or, or other components of it, that they they miss that bigger picture, like you said, of what does that reporting output need to look like for every audience? Yeah, you wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but I talked to somebody last week where they were using one of the leading applications in the space, essentially as a big calculator for about 50% of their incentives, no crediting, no data automation. And at the end, you know, I, I kind of walked away with, with two takeaways. One, that by having that application, they'd actually created more work for themselves uh, than not having the application. And two, they were getting about as much value from it uh, as a TI calculator that you could go buy for 15 bucks, you know, down at Target. And it was it was sad because I think that there is tremendous value to be had from doing it right. And that kind of is my next question for you is, what have you seen in terms of improvements or the value proposition that you were trying to realize through implementing? Where have you seen improvements? Yeah, I think one piece that I'll add on maybe to the prior question that feeds into this one is you do have to go through your entire process. When I came to work, Eva, our average ticket time was about 30 days. That's 30 days that sellers didn't have an answer or clarity into comp results or into a reporting request that they needed to drive a decision. And so not just cleaning up the data process, not just cleaning up approvals or plan docs, but also just SLAs around dispute management. That, that's a big one. Um, yes, of course, doing things manually hinders how quickly you can get that clarity and insight and the answer back to a seller or a manager or a leader of sales. But once you have it, you have to be willing to improve your processes with communication back to the sales teams. So we did that as well, right? The whole process got revamped, whether it was the tool, the, the dispute management, plan docs, right? Insights, whatever it was. So we implemented and went live Jan 1 of 2022. So the prior year, we had about 1.4 million in post payroll adjustments, meaning that was the total of errors, shifts, right? Pay adjustments we had to make right, plus or minus accounting accruals that we, you know, needed to readjust. Really painful every month, this big recon process. Nobody wants that. Nobody has time for that. And plus, the business has to go back and retroactive and, and make adjustments. And that's not fun for anybody. Also, sellers never were 100% confident where they sat in attainment because every month you're doing adjustments. In 2022, by December, we had brought that number down from 1.4 million-ish to $2,000. So in the entire year of 2022, we had a $2,000 variance or difference from what we submitted to payroll, and that's for every country, for every seller. Uh, we also were able to change all of our quarterly folks who were paid, or people who were paid quarterly, which were a lot of our support teams. Everybody was monthly from day one um, in January. And so that includes all of those support teams going down to a 99.99% reduction in uh, post-payroll adjustments, right? And that's tangible. That's the stuff people can put their hands on, they care about, accounting cares about it, finance cares about it. Yeah, it's amazing. Congratulations to you and the team there. That's, uh, I mean, that's just amazing just to go, what, three times as many payouts, quarterly to monthly, and then to reduce errors to virtually nothing uh, from, from material impact to virtually nothing. That's, that's super impressive. So congratulations. 
And it didn't take, you know, it, it wasn't overnight. We spent six months prior to go live. We knew how long implementation would take redoing all those processes that I just spoke about. So they all mattered. It didn't matter that we just had a tool. We didn't matter that data was coming in. The calcs were automatic. What mattered is we were now able to have a very solid, disciplined SLA process. We had done a complete policy uh, redesign as well uh, for the comp plan. We had made comp plan changes, but also really tightened up the policy itself. So the, the least amount of gray you can have, the more automated and seamless things go. And the more fair, right, and equitable it is onto how we're treating one-off and use cases uh, to the sales team. So that's a big deal. The other thing was we had never had expense reporting as quick as we did after implementation of the tool. And then very quickly, myself and my team was able to do true performance and productivity reporting, which is the fun stuff, which is what I want to spend time doing, not not working on a spreadsheet. Yeah. No, I think that transition from, you know, having having to be concerned with getting the right answer, like that first piece of the puzzle impacting bottom line, but then getting, like you said, to the fun stuff of looking at to what is, you know, how do we start to impact the top line through looking at different performance reports? And if we hadn't been as automated as we were, we're semi-annual uh, for our plan frequencies. So our plans run twice a year. Uh, we reset attainment twice a year. If we hadn't been in a place where we had improved all of those processes, we would have never understood some of the insights right into some of our comp plan methodology. And then since I own plan design as well, along with you know leaders in the company, we would not have been able to do a big overhaul like we did for this upcoming for 2023. We made pretty significant changes to our comp plan design, but none of that would have been possible if we didn't have this data at our fingertips, more real-time results, um, insights into productivity that we were able to, to pull on and draw on from selling behaviors that we saw uh, coming through the SPM tool. So it was, a, it was all about put together. One more question on just metrics. You mentioned a, about a 30-day turnaround for disputes and inquiries, and you said SLAs. What is that commitment to the sales team now if they questioned or were uncertain if they were paid correctly today? Yeah, so response time is within two hours. There's consistent ticket checking, which obviously has gone down dramatically as well. Um, we used to get an average of about 250 a month. Now we get about 40. A lot of times it's clarification, not errors, which is good. Uh, and then turnaround SLAs, right now we're trending about 2.1 days on average, and it's been consistent since summer. All right. So that's implementation. Let's talk about the comp plan design. You mentioned that you folks do it twice per year, which I think not maybe becoming more common as I talked to more and more companies recently. I still think that's probably not the most frequent uh, periodicity for sales compensation plan design. I think most folks are locked into an annual cycle for planning. How long do you know how long you guys have been doing it every six months and and what's what's the why behind it? Yeah, they've been sem semi-annual for a long time. It was before I came. So I'm in my I did second full year and I know it's been at least six years or seven. It was all around flexibility with quotas. They were introducing new products. Um where people got into ESG a couple years ago. It was a big, big commitment. Um, we have a, a unique matrix model at Workiva. We have sellers and we have overlay specialists and they fell side by side. And so essentially, as we were coming up with those coverage models for various products that were going to be strategic, there was this, this comfort in knowing that they could readjust mid-year. We're also pretty cyclical when it comes to the cap market side, the SEC side. If there's fluctuations in markets, we're going through you know a bit of a, a shift in market right now. There's that potential to reset and right size. Uh, a good example of where this has been to our benefit was back in 2020 and 2021. Um, so as we saw the markets drastically open up right in 2021, it was a crazy year. We set numbers in the beginning of the year. It was, you know, there were just there were deals just falling into people's laps in 2021. Uh, so it was a good opportunity to reset mid-year and just get everybody's expectations aligned with performance potential and territory potential. And so our um, our head of sales really likes that flexibility. Though so, you know, I won't lie, we've had requests and asks on on annual plans uh, coming from other leaders in the company. But from a seller's perspective, they love it because they can hit kickers and uh, the the higher rates twice a year. Got it. I was going to ask the the sales people from a recruiting and retention standpoint, what did they think about it? And I think you answered the question of the because of the design potential for accelerators or kickers two times per year makes it exciting for them. Yeah. And they're, and they're, you know, they're full uh, kickers and accelerators. They're not divided by two. So it's full percentage potential on 
that semi-annual attainment, which sometimes is good, sometimes bad. Just uh, it's a different lens that you have to look at performance by the reps uh, when you do it more frequently. Annual is easy, right? You look at that trend through the year, you kind of see the the natural inflection points. Semi-annual is a little different. Uh, it's a shorter time frame, and you have to kind of pick out where the optimization can be in the sales cycle between the quarters or even within the quarter uh, because it's a you know it's just a half so you just have two quarters of activity to try to trend and see what influenced their attainment or their behavior yeah i would think one you guys would really understand you know see how seasonality impacts quota and sales but two i think you know ramp time as it crosses over like these six month thresholds and different types of things like i think those would be key pieces of information to help set those quotas so I saw something, I think, even today where people are still, you know, last year's information is still trickling in from surveys and different types of things about quota attainment across different industries. And I think today's number I saw was, oh, I want to say, in the 50 percentile of, you know, AEs made quota last year. And it wasn't super surprising to me. I think that companies have really struggled with quota setting in 2020 uh, for obvious reasons, 2020. I think there's a bigger 2021 bigger recovery than a lot of people were expecting. 2022, you know, I think people expected to build on 2021. That didn't happen. And now we go into 2023 and people are looking at three years of data that's pretty mixed and, and different types of things. Have you found with the, the semi-annual quota setting that you're able to achieve, we'll just say greater than or less than industry standard attainment of quota uh, by the reps? You don't have to share a specific percentage. That's probably confidential. But are, do you feel like you you guys do better than than this mid fifties number? Or I think we yeah we we definitely we we are above industry average. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I was reading an article the other day where this came up, and I was trying to put a word on it. I think they called it RAM. You know, there's TAM, which is a great metric for investors and and that yeah. side of the house. And the, there's the SAM market, yeah. Yeah, there's there's SAM and then this acronym RAM, right? What's realistic? I think that Workiva does really good diligence on realistic. I think that we're we are targeting, you know, that fine mix between SAM and making sure it aligns to we, you know, the new new term RAM. I think that's appreciated amongst sellers. We have really good tenure metrics. Um, we do have a competitive comp plan that is fair and equitable. We do have quota setting that. No, we we do have a lot of white space and green space, uh, depending how you how you look at it with some of the new products and strategic products that have opened up. But we do know our, our legacy market really well. Our next evolution of some of that quota insight will be actually trying to look at competitors, you know, trying to determine if a company is using a competitor, how long has that been, how long have they been engaged, do they use other products? It it gives us a better understanding of waiting because right now all of that competitive ch- type chasing goes into this potential SAM. And you and I both know that's not that's not accurate. It can't be weighted at 100 percent That's that's not your space to go chase, right, all the time, especially if they just signed a three-year deal with a competitor. So we're trying to add that intelligence in. We also have a unique uh MSP partnership play now. So we are focusing a lot on our partnerships across a uh, some of the, the 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 audit companies out there and some of the other other folks that we interact with and and that's another layer right of quota setting is to understand are we getting into territories and accounts where they are going to inevitably have a partner right that carries MSP and, and has seats and licenses so we do have to do some due diligence around that to make sure we're we're giving reps an acceptable bag if we don't put MSP or partner responsibilities on them are we making sure that we account for that so we're working towards that adding that layer in. And then that to our reps, we've done surveys, you know, they have good things to say about quotas. And, and you know that that is challenging to get that feedback. It's, you know, there's always the the standard gripe. It's never enough or, you know, <laughs> or John, John Doe, Jane Doe has more than I do, but we work really hard to make sure we can prove out a lot of those conversations or arguments or feedback. And, and for the most part, again, our tenure, I think, you know, shows that it's fair, it's equitable. And, and I know because I own the comp plan. Uh, that it's you know not the comp plan is not a is not rewarding them for anything it shouldn't be and it's over rewarding for you know over excellence. What type of metrics have you put in place to to gauge the effectiveness of the plan? So we have a a new plan methodology this year. So we went from paying a kind of a flat rate type way to a true OTE model. A big shift, right? There's 
folks who have been at Workiva for a very long time on the old model that you know aren't used maybe aren't used to kind of the newer folks coming in that are used to on target earnings or an OT model. End of the day, kind of the math's the same. It's just new vernacular. And what we wanted to pay attention to first was, you know, have we set that up correctly? So there was a lot of work that went into that to make sure we are paying, uh, you know, we pride ourselves in paying above market average for, you know, great sellers when we do that. And then we looked at what teams need support that can be handled by more, you know, junior selling or, or you know, reps uh, that we need to, to fill that gap, kind of that middle ground. And so we've come to a really good balance uh, on the OTE. And so now the metrics are all about, in the beginning, just trying to gauge what is our difference in sales by product, by team, by region, and variable pump that goes along with that. So that's going to be baseline just from a financial accounting type responsibility. And then we have not had any shifts in trajectory of timing. But what we did about a year and a half ago is we changed how much we credit in the future. So in other words, if there's a future start date. So we honed in on that and we try to look at every deal if it closed that month, the current month, prior month, or that following month, was there any change in behavior trajectory when we made that change on to how far in advance you get credited? So we've done some of that. And then on back to the model change itself, we'll be looking at, we just sent out a rep scorecard. It has 26 competency metrics that ASDs are in charge of filling out. So they actually are filling out for their reps and giving their opinions about where there's coachable opportunities. Uh, where they're selling behaviors that they think are are coachable, or is there something that they can help train others, take away right good behaviors, and then teach others? And we try to work those in and that feedback into spiffs and contests as well, because we believe that's the best way to to draw those out. It's kind of like the Audi example. No, I just want to dig deeper into that. So this you have an, this idea is very interesting to me. We have a competency model. You said about twenty six different dimensions to it. You sent it out to the sales managers to fill out for their people. Quick question, do the, are the individuals, do they have any input like from a 360 degree view or is it just top down kind of view of here's where I see this person up against this, against these competencies? So it's the first line manager, director, if there is one, and then the VP. So they all came in. And so first line manager first took their pass and then the mm -hmm. other two layers added it in. We're at the point right now where that'll be shared back. And then you're creating you said some sort of incentives, spiffs or something around improvement to this competency model. Is that the individual level or a, some kind of aggregate? If you felt like everybody across the board, maybe you were low in negotiation, so you want to improve negotiation or is it at the individual or team level, I guess is the next question. So what we're doing is we're trying to bucket into a theme per quarter. So as, okay. as you probably agree, right, you can't do 20 spiffs and you need to do things that are meaningful and change behavior and, and do it for the long term. <laughs> I don't want 15 spiffs. What we wanted to do is do, you know, pull out where the good behaviors are and how can we convince others that they're meaningful activities to either go do or chase. Not everything necessarily means it's a spiff, but it might be a gate to get a spiff. So for example, one of our divisions is chasing a particular steal for a spiff in Q1. It's a specific competitor that came out of the gate and we want to focus on them. But the minimum to get the spiff is a gate around Salesforce hygiene, which as everybody has issues with that, we, we need to improve that in a couple areas. So they have to have checks, you know, there's checks every Friday to make sure that their opportunities achieve the Salesforce hygiene. And then there's a gate on our, our pitch deck, essentially, right? We get a new pitch deck every year, every half that we want the reps to be versed on, know, know how to speak to it, know how to give the pitch. A lot of your tenured folks, they don't care to do that, you know? They just, they think they know it. They sell, they get attainment. Great, I'm a great seller. Well, that's, that's not true, right? Attainment isn't the only thing that gauges whether you're a good seller or not. So we have these gates to ensure that our most tenured sellers still stay engaged, but at the same time that they have opportunities to teach others. And we have ways around that and some spiffs around that. For clarity, around this idea of the competency model, is there direct incentives or as you're describing it, it's a gate to something else like accelerators or some eligibility for some other in for incentives? So the competency model today is, it was the, the first stab at that true holistic, all 600 plus people getting scored across these competencies that we determine matter. And we're able to track 
and we're able to somehow put data behind it. And then some of it's behavior, right? That we can't track. That's the that's the other part that my team, right? We can't we can't support. We don't know the sellers. We don't know if they have things like passion for the company, if they draw the right people in at the right time. In other words, their specialist counterparts. That's really hard to track, even with good Salesforce record keeping, right? You could listen to all the recordings of calls, but nobody has has time to necessarily do all that. So they're they're not used as any part of the core comp plan. The competencies are being used to drive initiatives and SPIFs for ongoing quarters. So, okay. and there are gates for other, you know, again, other contests or SPIFs. So we have the active Q1 contest for one team. However, we notice that that entire team has a gap in XYZ competency. So those will be the gates or the thresholds of things they have to achieve in order to get the actual fundamental SPIF that was laid out for them. It's super interesting to me. It's not an idea that I had thought about before, this idea of like, you know, really thinking about sales performance management and not just incentive compensation management. I think this is an interesting angle. Out of curiosity, did you come up with that internally there at Work Even or did you work with a, a partner or it was me bringing that to the table because mm-hmm. I was tired of hearing the same complaints around oh, we need them to fix their hygiene. Oh, the best sellers don't sit there and do their recordings. Oh, they don't do this. And I kept seeing spiffs and contests be thrown at me that I'm like, yeah, this is great, right? But John Doe over there, he's still not, like he's on my bad list of people that aren't doing the right things. And how can we solve that? And so I told our VP of sales, I said, you know, I I think you should start putting bonus. Yes, they get a salary. Yes, they're expected to do their job, right? And some people can say Salesforce hygiene, that's your job, bringing the right people and that's your job. But if nobody is sitting there enforcing it, nobody's policing it to some degree, it it doesn't make a difference. They just get a free pass because if they have high attainment or they have, you know, good good other levers that we're saying are important, then then we overlook it. But it really damages some of other process insights that we're trying to achieve. And so I said, you know, I think this should be a minimum. I think if you're gonna throw money at a rep and give them extra potential, then at minimum they should do right what we need. Uh, from these competency standpoints that we can we can gauge and track. And so um, that idea came from me. But again, it was background of working with other customers, knowing consultants in the space. I hadn't heard of anybody necessarily using this on a, a large scale personally, but I do know it's out there. And then when I spoke to a colleague in the space, they said, oh, yeah, you know, we've uh, we've put gates on quarterly bonuses because of things like hygiene or training mm-hmm. or things that other reps just haven't done. So yeah, so it, it seems to be where it was well received. We're seeing some some benefit from it already on on one of our core initiatives. And again, I think uh, what's interesting is people were targeting newer reps around the theory, thinking newer reps right don't check the boxes because they don't know or they haven't been trained. Mm-hmm. And really, it's your tenured reps. Right? It's your tenured reps that feel like they don't have to revisit material. It's your tenured reps that feel like they don't need feedback and that you know they'll just go teach somebody yeah. when they have time. Over time, they've created their own playbook that maybe isn't quite up to date. Yeah, and so one of the interesting things, this uh, this, this half, what we're doing for the ASDs is they have you know about six to eight uh, a person that's not too overwhelming um, on their teams. Uh, we're actually having them listen to a minimum of three calls per rep for the half. And that includes tenured reps. We had folks ask, oh, do we really need to do the tenured reps? Yep, absolutely. And they have to do a, a feedback card and it's, you know, what went well on the call, what didn't, uh, where can you improve? Or maybe if they really are a rock star rep, what can you take away and how will we train folks yeah. and maybe we share this reporting because it's it's great, right? You you did such a great job and we need people to understand how, how you did that. Uh, so that's on the frontline managers because, you know, they, they struggle sometimes to manage tenured folks as well or new folks and they don't always know where their gaps are. And we think listening on these calls will be a really great learning opportunity for everybody in the sales team. Kind of last topic area. And then I have two questions I ask everybody that comes on the podcast. But kind of the last topic area that I wanted to get into was uh, sales compensation administration. And I think this is very near and dear to our hearts because we worked on some of these these projects together trying to help people out get better at that process. Can you tell me a little bit about your process there at work Eva around sales compensation administration? To, uh, and, I, and I guess that, you know, from everything else you've mentioned so far, you know, kind of a world-class organization. I'm assuming this is right, falls in the same category, but uh, tell me what a payroll looks like there at Work Eva from a sales comp admin perspective. Yeah, so just kind of go through our, our process, like our yeah. daily, weekly process. Okay, we have a, a team of four. 
we definitely do not spend the majority of our day on comp or calc. Uh, somebody starts the engine at 7 a.m., just their their favorite time. So uh, we auto run about 7 a.m. Towards the end of the month, it gets more frequent. We do it on demand. Uh, we have thought through and built out a lot of error checking in our reports when the system runs. So we catch an error log every day, and that points out a lot of issues that are upstream in our CRM. So we're able to go back with the CRM partners. We have a standing meeting once a week. We bring forward all of the issues that we can't fix ourselves or that we believe are process changes. And that's a weekly meeting that's really beneficial and process changes get made uh, very quickly. That goes through and it's in real time. So people can put tickets in throughout the month. We deal with those tickets in one or two days. Most of the time, it's not any design breaks or you know anything like that. Um, everything's kind of set, and set up, tested through. And uh, payroll comes and we have a list of about 21 activities that we make sure, 22 maybe now, uh, that we make sure get checked off, exchange rates, things like that, get updated, all the motions uh, get done. And then we have a check and balance, which I think is really important. Um, We have about 25 to 30 different checks that we've automated for the end results. So we do things like check to make sure every order got credited, make sure that every order got credited to a direct team or a partner team. Anybody who's on indirect crediting, uh, you know, through different relationships or through different, you know, um, if they're not over the specific team, they get credit for. We have all of that built out for a check um, so that if anything gets missed or there's an odd order, right, that somehow gets left out, it, it's not missed. So it's a very automated process from our perspective. And it's a mix of the SPM tool and, you know, and, and sheets. And all of that just brings us confidence that we don't have to go through and cherry pick people. To, to check or, or that there's going to be any issues. Um, we'll do a couple tests. We run the top 10 earned uh, folks and make sure that those earnings align. There's nothing on there with big numbers, right? That might generate for the top 10. And then we look at everybody who's zero uh, just as a, as a final check. And then we go by country, by payroll. We have different payroll dates. We have about nine different payroll dates for nine different um, sets of countries that get looped into those nine payroll dates. And uh, that takes about, you know, maybe two to three hours for every payroll, every country. And there's somebody assigned to each country and each sales team. So that's how we have the team broken up. It's by sales team and by country for month end process. So from the time we close on day three is usually when we get the green light for pencils down. Um, We're doing, we're closing out disputes and doing final payroll checks by like day six. Uh, We run the data for the last time from the CRM by day six. There's really no reason to run it again. After that, we've, manage to fix everything throughout the month. Those are just last minute changes if something came in from those closed pending deals. And then, yeah, we uh, we have payroll deadlines. And I'd say we, we usually submit you know, four to five days before. We try to leave it open for the reps as much as possible. But honestly, the, the disputes just don't come in that late. So they all get a, an update. They all get pop-up messages. They all get emails to check their comp every month and do a pretty good job doing it. So all in all, our closed cycle is 10 days, but that's certainly not full days um, of of trying to close out the month. Yeah, I think the one thing you just covered that eludes a lot of companies is this idea of a built-in, what I'll call QA, QC process. And it's interesting to hear some of the reports that you mentioned as ways to check, checks and balances, right? To see, is there anything unusual that we should dig into deeper throughout the different stages of the process? So... Yeah. And it it can be, you know, people think it's maybe just those outlier folks or your special humans that you have on, on different plans or different crediting methodologies. But the truth is products could come in and change a skew. They could come in and change a category and maybe you don't have visibility into that. So on the front end, again, we have about our error log is made up of, I think, 45 checks at this point. It really does catch 90% of any, you know, outliers that exist. And then we come in behind and have those other checks built in for all the other. Uh, potential issues that we've ever seen. And we keep adding to them. If we have one, it gets added to the check. So we either figure out if we can automate the check or if it needs to go to our manual check at the end of the month. Because if there's one, there will always be another. <laughs> that, is, that is true. All right. So what's sort of the big challenges for 2023 in those three areas? Anything left to tackle? Sounds like admin dialed in, comp plans, big change made, maybe some minor tweaks for the next six months. And then the, the overall, uh, you know, implementation is done. So what, from the area of sales performance management, what are the next hurdles? What's kind of the next evolution? 
Uh, we just completed HR integration. So we do have that built in as well. We just revamped our verbiage and our selling points are, you know, are, are, are great things about work Eva with recruiting. So they, they're they armed with a really strong message. I think, I think sometimes people forget about recruiting. Recruiting really benefits to know about the comp plan, know what the great things are in that, be able to talk to the folks applying. Because as you know, they're the applicants are being told to ask hard questions. What was your attainment? What's my average quota? How many people beat quota? How many didn't? Um, what's your average tenure? We want our recruiting armed and very transparent and be able to speak to those metrics. So I can't manage that, right? I can't be on every recruiting call or, or offer that goes out. But we just wrapped up where they all feel very confident and have, you know, are able to sell work Eva for all of its uh, great things and attributes and, and a great place to work. So we wrap that up. The next stage uh, for my team is we also own forecasting. And so um, we are automating forecasting. We have a, you know, a tool uh, to help do that, to be able to drive consensus, to drive more of that scoring, right? So we talked to competencies, but just scoring of deals. And we all know what gives us higher percentages of wins, but that's not always looked at uh, at a by deal level. So we're doing that really holding the managers again accountable, reps accountable for hygiene and, and how we forecast and what creates a good score. Uh, so we have an account scoring uh, side to the team that's working on that for 2023. And then being able to tie and pump into the forecasting is a, a big win for us. Being able to show how much money you're leaving on the table or losing uh, if you don't close the deal or if you change mechanics behind the deal. So we hope that motivates as well. Uh, just be, you know, beyond just the, uh, the fear of the score and scorecard coming out not in their favor. That's that's enough on my plate for 2023. So, Yeah, for sure. All right, two last questions, and then we're at the end of our time here together today. The first one, who in the world of sales comp would you most like to take out to lunch? The world of sales comp? Hmm. If you want to, ex- I always say if you want to expand it to sales management, or that's fine. Honestly, I always enjoy having lunch with you, Justin. I think you have a Thank lot you. of insight in the space and and it's always good to talk about what productivity and performance really means. So definitely look to you as a, a thought leader in the space. I actually recently, I'm really intrigued by what RepView is doing. And those two folks over there, Mark and oh, I forgot the other individual's name. We've had some chats and I would really like to sit down with them uh, just because they're they're trying to take on this, this view of sales performance and what that means to sellers and employers. And I think that they're they're creating something that's really beneficial that in the past has had to you know, we had to get through surveys or we had to get through consultant lenses. And I, I really like where they're going with the direction of sales performance visibility and the fact that it's visible for anybody, again, for sellers to understand other companies and what performance means, and then for employers to understand what they look like compared to peer groups. I think it's powerful. Yeah, for sure. Even as you mentioned that idea of you are giving HR some information in the recruiting process, my mind, that's exactly where it went, was this idea of rep view, where I would want the rep view report and then kind of my view of the world, right? This is what reps who left the company or people that are, you know, are reporting to rep view, but this is kind of how we analyze it because it might not be uh, 100% accurate or the same. And if there is a story that you need to tell around it, because maybe you're not showing up on rep view uh, as positively as you would like, right? You're, it's another thing you have to, to work against. But, you know, Contrary, if you're showing up good on RepView, you know, utilize it in your favor to help uh, recruit and retain reps. But yeah, no, it's an interesting, interesting company for sure. The crowdsourcing of information is pretty powerful. All right, last question. Uh, you've seen me now for a number of years uh, do Zooms from my library. I think you know that I like to read books. Uh, do you have a recommendation of a book people could go read? Same topic, sales management, sales compensation. Who should people uh, go check out? Yeah, me once. I just is it sales data through storytelling? I think that's the is that the. I just finished reading it. It was great. It's something I can just keep keep by. It was from the library though. I had to give it back, but I'm going to buy it. It was um, it was storytelling through data. I'll have to get you the link, but essentially, it's just a, a quick guide. If you're going to put out any data around performance or productivity. Mm-hmm. What should you consider? And you and I, you know, we had to do a lot of PowerPoints. We had to do a lot of graphs. We had to do a lot of visualizations. And that was all well. And I, I, I think, you know, I did it to some degree well uh, for, for the folks I worked with. When 
we're really trying to get points across and change and transform processes like we, we're, I'm doing here at Workiva, that visual storytelling becomes really important. And so just those quick tips, you can flip to like the bar chart section and say, if you're considering putting a bar chart in, what do you need to do, right? Do you gray everything out except the one you want people to look at? Do you add different font? Do you make sure you're not being subjective with the gaps that you have between the, you know, whatever your measurements are? It's just great to have. So anytime I'm thinking about putting something out, you know, I have to put it out to the CEO, CO. I'm like, oh, let me flip to that. So it's on uh, my Amazon order. Uh, it's coming in because the library did not let me um, keep it after four renewals. Uh, it's yeah, storytelling with data. Sorry. Storytelling, storytelling with, with data. data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely have to check that out. We could have used that a few times over the years when doing some survey analysis. Yeah, we could. Yep. Got it. Got it. 18 colors on a on a pie chart. Yeah, it works. No, it doesn't. Yeah, but it's storytelling with data, a data visualization guide. So. All right. Maria, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed the conversation. I think others will as well. The one, the, again, the one thing that I think that the people listening should take away is what Maria just described in those three areas is absolutely world-class and some of the the best of the best you're ever going to hear. And I have a feeling you're going to get a few networking requests for people to get, you know, for people to get a few more details in some of those areas, because there's a lot of folks, you know, and I know struggling across one of these three dimensions of tooling, admin process, or sales compensation plan, design, or design process. And people are always looking for ways to get better. It makes me happy to run into folks like yourself out there as practitioners now that kind of took everything you learned as a consultant and and are applying it and uh, and transforming your company as you do so. So but thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, thank you. And of course, anybody can reach out. I'm always happy to chat SPM. So pleasure to join you and hope it helps somebody. The Sales Compensation Show was brought to you by Forma AI, the world's most advanced sales compensation solution. To learn more about how Forma AI makes sales comp more valuable to your business, visit forma.ai. Find us by searching for sales compensation in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or anywhere else podcasts are found. And make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. On behalf of the team here at Forma AI, Thank you for listening and stay smart out there.